It is my great pleasure for the second time in the history of these symposia to have too far back. All right. It is my great pleasure that for the second symposium in the entire list of symposia that have, ha have occurred, we have a musical item to introduce and enjoy. And I think for many of you, it will be a new experience. I've already been told that anything that comes from a computer can't be music, so we will have to see if maybe that person's mind can be changed. We have two guests, both of them impressively distinguished. Rose Bolton, as you will read in the program, has had much success with her compositions, and she has written a number of documentary film scores. I think the performance at the Luminato Festival with 800 people listening must have been very, very gratifying for her. Pemi Pauli is going to show how somebody who is a Baroque musician can cooperate with computers. I think we're all in for a very interesting experience. Thank you both for coming. Okay, so I'm um, welcome everybody and hello and thank you for um, having us here. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the computer as a musical instrument um, because we know that uh, the computer can aid the listening experience to music in many ways, but what I'm talking about is the computer as an instrument in itself, the creator, a creator of sound. Okay, so as I said, the computer as a musical instrument, as opposed to, say, the computer that, as, you know, as a tool used to develop advanced recording technologies. Um, the computer as an emitter of sound, um, used by a composer. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And so, of course, uh, some people might think, or, or maybe not, a lot of people won't, but some people, when you think of a computer you, and then you think of music, you think, well, imagine cre using a computer as a means of artistic expression. Um, but no sooner was, had the computer been invented that people started to use the computer as a means of artistic expression. Um, they were exploring how to, a computer could make sound. Um, in the same way that in the late 19th century when electricity was invented or electricity came to be, um, really started to catch on or be used, people were using electricity to um, create sound, and so it's actually just a continuation um, of every time there's an innovation, um, people will try to find a way to harness the innovation. And so the question today is, what role does the computer have in classical music? And, and I'm specifically talking about classical music here. Um, okay, so there was a f there were small pockets of people who, whenever there was a new technology, um, were really excited about the idea of creating new sound, something new. Um, this, is, this picture here is actually, um, it's, it's uh, from the 1960s, although um, electronic and computer music started before that. But this is a Canadian composer named Norma Beecroft in, in, her, in the electronic music studio. Uh, and I believe this is the University of Toronto and what she is doing here is she's using um, the devices that were kind of the early components of electronic music. Uh, actually, I use the term electronic music and computer music interchangeably because what started out as electronic music, eventually the computer became more and more integrated in, in the creation of electronic music. Um, so she's using a tape recorder and she also has on the right there's a synthesizer. So you have uh, the recording of sounds, which was part of early electronic music, 
and then you had the creation of synthesized sounds through oscillators, which is what she's doing on the, on the right. Uh, so there was mechanically produced sounds and naturally recorded sounds, and these sort of, these are the basic building blocks of what became electronic and computer music. Um, so I'm gonna jump back to the beginning and, and talk a little bit about the, a long time ago in the invention of electricity and just to give you a couple of examples of people's curiosity. Um, uh, in 1906, there was a, a, a musical instrument invented called the Telharmonium. Uh, it was invented by a, a creator by the name of Thaddeus K. Hill. And this instrument was seen as the, one of the proto-synthesizers and it weighed 200 tons. Uh, so it didn't exactly catch on. And shortly after that, in the 1920s, the invention of the theremin um, and the invention of the owned Martineau, and these were all instruments that used um, electri electricity to develop new sounds. Uh, then in Canada, uh, Hugh Lacane at the National Re Research Council um, developed an instrument called the electronic sack butt, which was also seen as the proto or the original uh, voltage controlled synthesizer. And this is image number two. There it is. And you could see uh, Hugh Lacane didn't care too much about how the instrument looked. Um, unlike, say, some musical innovations of the 20th century, like the electric guitar, which is quite appealing to look at. This one is quite ramshackle. And you play, you play it with one hand, and then, uh, and then you with this, the other hand, you sort of there's, there's a disc there, and somehow you you do some sort of timbre manipulation with the with the other hand, and so that, so this was the developed in the late 1940s, the first synthesizer. So you can see how these inven inventions go quite. We're 70 years in, I think, in the creation of electronic music. So. Um, what are people's expectations for music? Um, music is designed to touch on a part of the human brain that elicits an emotion. At least that's what most people want to ha get out of music. I think, we, I think that's what music's role is and that's what music does best. And, and can a computer do this is the question. Okay, um, I'll get to more on that later. The fact is that in the early 20th century, there was a, a desire, a need for new sound. Uh, Edgar Varese, a uh, French composer, um, took a hiatus. In 1937, he famously said that the existing musical instruments were, were limiting. I'm, I'm not, those weren't his exact words, but essentially that's what he um, said and he took quite a long hiatus uh, in his work until uh, electronic music had developed. Um, something like more than 10 years, I think actually possibly 15 years. Um, the idea that musical instruments were uh, limiting is, uh, I can talk about what could be possibly limiting about the, the tri you know, t tried, tested and true instruments that are around. Um, but first, let me just continue a little bit more history. Um, we talked about early synthesizers, artificially produced sound. Not only was there artificially produced sound, but there was, uh, if there was early recording of sounds, real sounds and noises, and new, new sounds were created through the playing back of these sounds at different speeds, playing them in reverse, layering of sounds, which in our day we call mixing. And so these, all these innovations were happening in the 1940s after the war. A lot of technologies had been created f for the war and these technologies still existed. Um, Pierre Schaeffer in France uh, started up a group called the Groupe de Recherche and the, they recorded music with tape recorders and created all sorts of new stuff. It was the Unde unbelievable thirst for um, for new sounds, and that is the um, that is the same uh, thirst that I have even 
70 years later, and some and other people like me, the desire to create, to work new sound into music. Um, I'd just like to play a piece uh, that, uh, this is this piece of music that, when I was 21 years old, I heard this piece of music and it overturned my life. I decided that I wanted to devote my life to working new sounds into music. was called Dedans Dehors um, by a composer named Bernard Permigiani who worked, collaborated with Pierre Schaeffer. And that piece was written in 1977, so quite a few, couple decades after um, Pierre Schaeffer started the group de recherche. And, and this group was also in collaboration with a French radio um, broadcaster. So uh, the, the, the use of mechanical sounds combined with sort of more human sounds and noise. Combining sound and noise and music is what I decided I wanted to do and that, to make that my work. And so, um, so, that, so that's, what I'm, that's what I did. And last year, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, musical instruments and why it, it was important to me to combine sound, noise with music. Um, Musical instruments, traditional musical orchestral instruments, for example, uh, come with a history, they come with a tradition, a legacy. And you, uh, you really, it's very hard to write music for these instruments without the tradition that they bring with them. Um, for example, the horn um, is, a, is an instrument, and, and if you listen to any idiomatic film soundtrack and there's a, some sort of landscape scene long shot, people on horseback, hills, whatever, you're probably gonna hear a horn. And that's because the horn was an instrument that was, it was an outdoor instrument and it was often an instrument that was played in the, the hills, I'm pretty sure. And even if you don't think that now, it's still in there, it's, it's so deep set. And, and, and for another example of an instrument is the organ, the church organ, which is, really actually another proto version of the synthesizer. It was an instrument that could imitate the sounds of all sorts of instruments. Um, but the organ is very hard to disassociate with the church. Um, so with electronic sounds was uh, a blank canvas, a blank slate. You could use the computer to, um, you could use the computer and then, because the computer eventually took over from what these synthesizers did. Eventually everything was in the computer. And uh, it was, it, one little computer replaced all these larger devices. But what I'd like to show you is uh, slide number three. Um, okay, so this is, um, uh, it looks quite complicated, but you can also see that it actually looks not too different from earlier synthesizers where you turned a lot of knobs and things. Instead of turning knobs on real devices, now this is what I do. I turn knobs, except they're not real knobs, they're virtual, except I, instead of using my fingers, I just use the mouse. So even though music is created by the computer now, the interface, the, the relationship you have to these devices hasn't changed. There's people still want to turn a knob. And if, if anybody was curious, you could, you could come up to the front um, and see that I have 
little buttons and things like that. So the actual relationship a, a human has to a machine where you, you press things, you turn things, it still remains. Uh, so I, I created um, Song of Extinction last year, and I combined the sounds made by my computer with musical instruments and choir. Um, and this, the reason I did this is because the sounds coming from uh, my goal was to create emotion with computer, but also that the the sound coming from the computer was a, a blank slate, a new sound that wasn't uh, didn't carry the associations that traditional instruments have, like a violin. You know, you as a violinist, I, I know when I hear a violin, I you hear the tradition of all the repertoire starting even before Bach, starting with Corelli, and then all the way up to the Romantic concertos. And it, it just, car it, it just it's hanging there. So with the computer, something new. And uh, with Song of Extinction, what I did is I had two choirs, Tafel Music uh, Chamber Choir uh, and the Viva Youth Chorus of Toronto, and um, seven string players, uh, two organs, and some percussion, and then myself on the laptop. And when I would play the laptop, you could see all the musicians on the stage. In fact, that's the next uh, image. Let's take a look at that. So there, there we are at the Hearn, which is the Hearn generating station. Uh, it was a giant space. I wasn't on the stage. I was back, at the very back. Um, but that was the reason for that was because when you heard the computer-generated sounds, they don't have a presence on the stage like the musicians do. So in that way, the sound from the computer could represent something uh, for some forces beyond human control, like weather or something. So um, I'll play you the first, one of the first songs that we did, and, and you can see that the choir was singing about signs of nature and how what they were singing about, their singing went into my computer and back out with lots of effects and things. And so the human voices are dissipating in the atmosphere. And that's what I wanted to uh, convey was a sense that the signs of nature as humans, we're not necessarily reading those signs. We're trying to, but they just dissip dissipate in nature. So here's a, an example. from Song of Extinction was called Where Are We To? I actually, we cl I collaborated with a really amazing poet by the name of Don Mackay who doesn't own a computer. And that was his definite choice. Um, and uh, so this song is called Where Are We To? And it's pe where humans are singing about where this is all going, basically. It's a question. And so in, the, in, in this excerpt the electronic component comes in like I said to represent some a force of nature or something beyond our control so you don't see a performer performing the sound like you do with the instruments and choir you just there's this aura that surrounds the players
Helen, this, if you were there, it would be would have been louder. But this was a I wanted to that the electronic part was representative of kind of like a fog, something overcoming us. Okay, so fine. Into the final uh, component of my talk is uh, uh, a piece that I wrote for this show, um, where I wanted to combine the musicianship, the amazing playing of Pemi, who's a really emotive and virtuosic violist and violinist, with with my sounds from the computer. And the goal was to create something that had an emotional feel to it.
Okay, before we start the third session of the day, I would just like to remind you that in your program you all had an evaluation sheet. And on this sheet we not only ask you to tell us how terrific this program was and how much you enjoyed it, but also to make suggestions for next year's symposium. And I just also want to mention to you that we take these forms seriously because last year we got a note from one of our attendees that said, suggested to discuss next year the meteoric rise of the use of technology and its effect. And so based on this suggestion by one of these young ladies who is sitting right there in the light blue, we anonymously selected this, um, this topic for this year's, the committee selected, without knowing who made the suggestion, selected her topic for this symposium. So please try hard to give us good suggestions for next year. Um, so far, we have heard about um, how advancement of technology transforms communities, affects the future of news, of libraries, of composition of musics, music, and also we considered engineering, software, and artificial intelligence. We are now going to have a little bit different topic, uh, which is the role of construction and engineering technology in design process um, of important buildings. It is my pleasure to invite Dermud Nash to present this talk. He's going to talk about some important great buildings and he'll tell you what. His bio is on the program and we are pressed a little bit for time, so I'm not going to tell you all his achievements, his current position as an architect, his awards and many recognitions, but I urge you to read it. And now I will ask him to come here. Um, thank you, thank you, Suzanne. I had um, just a bit of a preface to my my presentation to you this e this afternoon. I had an opportunity to uh, share the seat next to Suzanne when I was flying to London. And by the time I arrived in London, I'd agreed to speak today, <laughs> unequivocally. And that was like a couple of months ago. And three weeks ago, it was, oh my God, I've got to start doing this. So, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous honor to speak to the senior college. Um, it's an incredible um, group of individuals, intellectuals. Um, and so it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, anyway. It is what it is, and I will talk to you today about um, my participation and my involvement on projects that uh, involve the Aga Khan, the Aga Khan Foundation, and um, <coughs> the Ismaili uh, community. Um, as uh, Suzanne said, I'm a partner at Moriyama Tashima Architects with Raymond Moriyama and Ted Tashima, and we were asked um, a number of years ago uh, to participate as um, uh, architects working with the Aga Khan Foundation and working as well with a number of uh, remarkable um, uh, international architects, which I'll talk briefly about, and um, as well as working with uh, His Highness the Aga Khan, uh, with the Ismaili community and with an extraordinary group of individuals here and in Ottawa that uh, we worked on three specific projects with. Um, but first of all, which way is this? Uh, I wanted to start with 1972, because um, 1972 is a, a very critical, uh, critical year in the, uh, I guess, in the culture and the span of Ismaili Muslims in Canada. But 1972, when I was doing research, was also there was a lot going on in 1972, and I think because perhaps uh, we didn't uh, have sort of the internet or that kind of proximity to some of the events in the world, there was a lot that happened that year. That year. And one of them, of course, was this incredible game uh, where Canada uh, beat Russia, I think, with 34 seconds left uh, when Paul Henderson scored uh, for Canada. And that was, um, I mean, I think that was an electric moment for Canada. Um, and it was a really extraordinary proud moment. But the interesting thing 
is that it was also towards the end of the Cold War, so it had a Cold War component to it of communism versus capitalism, and that sort of ran through the, uh, the games at the time. But this was an extraordinary, it's a great image and an extraordinary moment and a very kind of proud and happy moment uh, for Canadians. Um, there was also the year that um, a certain Jay Gordon Liddy, who was the uh, Republican counsel for um, the Republican Party, the lawyer for the Republican Party, proposed that they burglarize the Democratic National Party at the Watergate Hotel and um, sort of tap um, what the thinking was in the Democrat Party. And I think we all know that that ended a few years later with uh, Nixon uh, resigning uh, as, as president. It was also the year that uh, the United States was in the middle of negotiation with um, the, the North Vietnamese and they were running into, um, uh, I guess, problems. The North Vietnamese, they were, they were negotiating in Paris. The, the North Vietnamese had withdrawn from the table and they began this Christmas bombing campaign where they dropped 45 million pounds of explosives on uh, a lot of it on Hanoi. And the intention was to bring uh, the North Vietnamese back to the table and drive a conclusion to the end of the Vietnam War. Um, it was also the year that um, Munich in September, I think, um, where um, 11, 11 Israeli athletes died, uh, five uh, Palestinian uh, nationalists died, and I guess a German policeman died uh, in, that, in those, that week that um, kind of paralyzed uh, the world and had the world watching and kind of diverted the attention away from the games, but sort of brought up uh, you know, some prominent um, geopolitical issues that still run today. It was also the year that the British government uh, prorogued the Northern Ireland Parliament and basically instituted uh, direct rule with uh, Northern Ireland, which again instituted a lot of civil unrest and saw again um, a great deal of that kind of um, violence move over to then England and, and London with a subsequent bombing taking place over a number of years until that actually was resolved, I think, in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreements. And then, of course, was the year in 1972 uh, when Idi Amin, in August 1972, um, decided that, uh, that he wanted to expel um, all of the Asians, South Asians, uh, from Uganda, um, many of whom who had been in Uganda for generations, many of whom owned uh, very large businesses and were in many respects uh, the backbone of the economy of, of Uganda. Um, he gave them 90 days to to um, uh, to leave the country. First, they, first they had to register. I think it was a it was a it was a sequenced process. They first decided to expropriate the property, then the, the expulsions came after that. Um, and so that actually was one of the key significant events. And it was happening around the same time as the as the uh, um, the games in Canada as as, as well the, the World Hockey Summit. But many of the Ismaili Muslims came to Canada, um, and they came as a result of um, the Aga Khan, who uh, had a personal connection to Pierre Trudeau, and uh, I think they had been students in Harvard together, and that connection opened up doors. They really only had 90 days, and that connection opened up doors for um, the Ismaili community, the majority of whom came to Canada at that time. And here we have an image of the Aga Khan at a much younger age uh, with uh, Pierre Trudeau. At that time, um, anyway, before I go any further, uh, there's also a story that connects to uh, the uh, hockey summit. I'll just go back. There is a story that the Aga Khan tells, and it may be uh, somebody, uh, and I actually just read this the other day, so I was actually wondering, it's quite a remarkable story. But... Uh, the Idi Amin uh, passed his decree in August, and there were 90 days. And by, by the time Game 8 was on, which I think was September, was it September 28th? So it was towards the end of September. There was really only 30 or 40 days. And the number of Ismailis that were going to be admitted to Canada had not been resolved. So apparently, the way I read it was that the Aga Khan was at a meeting in, in Ottawa on the day of the game. And um, at the end of the game, the d double the number of Ismailis were allowed into the country. <laughs> and he wasn't sure why that was the case, but um, he felt that there was a lot of distracted uh, federal officials that were kind of <laughs> observing the game on one hand, and they were just like so extraordinarily happy that they, they opened it up and brought... Uh, so there's that kind of connection back to that, that event and that happened at the end. 
But the, the, one of the significant uh, um, kind of um, kind of intellectual or strategic um, elements was that a number of the community leaders um, got together and they would decided that they would build new spaces, obviously build new communities in the countries that they moved to, that they would build new spaces, um, that there would be spaces where they could gather their community and practice their faith. Uh, there would be spaces where uh, common grounds could be found between groups, different groups, and there would be spaces that would be symbols of hope, and that there would be spaces that would be symbols of light, which is what Suzanne had, well, of course, I'm here to talk about, but uh, there was that notion of wanting to create a strong connection to the symbol of light. And the projects that we were engaged in and the projects uh, that we had the great fortune to be collaborators on, on the, on the, on the Ag Khan Museum, on the Ismaili Center, and on the Delegation Building, which I wanted to talk to you about today, all, all of them were mandated uh, at some point that light had to be a, 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 uh, the, the notion, the concept, the idea of light had to be a part of the thinking process of the design process of what emerged in, in the designs of the of the design teams. Also in Islam, the, cr uh, the creator um, is understood in reference to light. So that becomes a strong connection to uh, God and the creator. That light becomes uh, then a very, very strong connection to, to that. So here's the Aga Khan, uh, Prince Shah Karim al uh, He was speaking to, he's speaking to Parliament. Uh, he's on the on the in, on the uh, occasion of being made an honorary citizen. Um, I think he's the fifth honorary Canadian uh, to to be made. And um, a few things about about the Aga Khan that that I think are really important in understanding. I think why these projects were built in Canada. Um, he is, of course, there's this um, great photograph of himself and Justin, uh, again, a strong connection to the, through the family. <clears throat> but Tiago Khan is also the founder and chairman of a major development uh, uh, international aid organization, and that's the Tiago Khan Development Network. So while the network operates around the world, it focuses on the poorest regions of Africa and Asia with a fundamental mission to fight poverty, changing the basics of quality of life, and replacing despair with hope. It's active in the fields of economic development, uh, job creation, education, healthcare, as well as important cultural initiatives. The work in the Aga Khan Foundation has always been uh, people-driven with a very simple mandate, which is to relieve disease, uh, deprivation, uh, and ignorance for the people they serve, no matter their faith. And I think I was just talking to, was it Sandra over here? She was talking about her daughter, who um, ended up at one of the Aga Khan hospitals in, where, in Africa. In Kenya, northern Kenya, was very sick, and um, it was a very interesting connection. Had incredible care, I think, and recovered there. So that's quite quite remarkable. So it kind of reaches out and touches all of us. So the Aga Khan Network, the Aga Khan Development Network, builds uh, schools, they build colleges, they build hospitals, power plants, and housing projects that benefit the people of all faiths in some of the poorest regions of the world. There's about 80,000 people that work for the Aga Khan Development Fund. Foundation Network, so it's a large organization. It's driven by a lot of volunteer and collaborative uh, uh, relationships that they build with other aid agencies throughout the world. But this, in my mind, this, the Aga Khan is a builder. He's a religious leader. Uh, part of his role as religious leader is to, is to, to kind of uh, interpret the Quran, but also he also provides for the material well-being of, of, uh, of the Ismaili Muslims at the same time. Um, and he's a builder. And as, and as a builder, and this is where as an architect, I think we really connect, is that he believes architecture is one of the forces that have transformational potential uh, through the buildings in which we spend, uh, as he said, at all ages, so many days and nights of our lives. This is actually, I think he's at the Aga Khan Museum. This, um, his dedication to architecture is best exemplified in the Aga Khan Awards for Architecture, which has more to do with improving the conditions of life of a vast part of humanity than it does with he her heralding a new architectural style. Um, it, it, the award, the architect architectural award, aims to identify and reward architectural designs that successfully address the needs and aspirations of Islamic societies 
in the fields of contemporary design, social housing, uh, community development, landscape design, um, and improvement of the environment. In my opinion is the Agacon Museum and the Ismaili Center are, pure, are truly examples of the Agacon's dedication to contributing to art, to culture, but also contributing to educating us uh, on the connections between uh, Islam and, and, and the West. But one of the buildings that I wanted to talk to you about is a building that's not in Toronto. We worked on the Toronto building, uh, the, the Agacon Museum and the, um, uh, the Ismaili Center out of Winford Park. But the, the project that we were first engaged in was the uh, delegation of the Is Ismaili Imamat, which is in Ottawa on Sussex Drive. Uh, we had an opportunity to work with uh, Fumihiko Maki, um, Japan's preeminent one of Japan's preeminent architects. Um, and I just thought I'd show you this image that um, I, think, I think Professor Maki, we, call, we always call him Professor Maki or, or Sensei, but it was Professor Maki. And um, he's, anyways, again, he's an, amazing, he's an amazing human being. I think in this picture, he's 86 years old in this photograph. Um, and um, Ted Tashima is the one side, and Gary Kamamoto, who is, uh, who is uh, Professor Maki's partner were sort of the three people that were heavily engaged in working on the delegation building in, in uh, Ottawa. <clears throat> so we were actually engaged just as we were finishing the Canadian War Museum <clears throat> and uh, another building in Ottawa called the Demaray Building at University of Ottawa. So we received a call from uh, Fumiko Maki's office and, um, and they asked us if we, they would like us to get involved. This is sort of in 2002, 2003 if we'd like to team with them as the executive architect for a project called the Delegation of the Ismaili Imamat, uh, which was to be located on Sussex Drive. And we said yes, and we said yes for three reasons. The first was the Aga Khan, of course, who we all knew as, um, as an incredible individual. We knew about the Aga Khan Foundation Network and uh, of also his kind of profound connection to architecture and design. Um, the second was that the delegation building, unlike the museum, and the Ismaili Center was actually quite a unique building. And so the program that would define that building was very progressive in terms of its purpose. And we found that also very, very appealing and attractive. And the third reason was really Fumi Igamaki, who, um, again, a remarkable individual. He's the uh, Pritzker Prize laureate, Nobel Prize winner, essentially, of, uh, the, uh, in, of the, uh, in architecture. He is the 67th AIA gold medals winner. Um, he is, um, his designs, I've always loved his designs. His designs in a way I find are very, they're very strong, but they're very humble at the same time. They're extraordinarily well detailed. They spend a great deal of time developing the craft of, of their buildings and their construction. And on this particular building, the delegation building, we were worked with PCL who is a well-known construction company, international construction company. First, I'd say I, I admire contractors tremendously. They take our drawings and our engineers' drawings, and they kind of figure out how to do it backwards. They work their way out of the ground, and they work their way up to the top of the roof. And we're kind of thinking of it from another way, and we come at it from another way. So I've always admired, uh, and PCL, I think, is one of the great um, Canadian construction companies amongst many good construction companies. But they were the builders, and we had an opportunity to go to Japan a few times before the project actually started, and the Aga Khan and the, the group that we worked with here called Winford, uh, the Sussex Drive, uh, this was a client group that we worked with. We went with PCL and we looked at Maki's buildings, um, and they said, yeah, no problem, no big deal. We can actually make that, that work in, in Canada. But when, in fact, when the work began on the projects, the, uh, the discovery that the detail of kind of tolerance for the construction elements coming together was sometimes zero and sometimes within millimeters. And really, these days, you like to leave lots of space between things so that if there's mistakes on site, you can actually fix them. Uh, one of the examples was that uh, there was a concrete wall that was poured. Uh, while this building is under construction, I'm kind of diverting here, but I wanted to point out the, 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 the attention to detail that Maki that Maki pays. 
the concrete was slightly off true. And in order for it, all the materials that were gonna come on top of the concrete, there was gonna be drywall, there was gonna be studs, there was gonna be wood, there was gonna be other elements. It wasn't quite, it wasn't quite straight. It wasn't quite perpendicular. The concrete had kind of, kind of wowed out a bit during uh, when it was formed. And uh, Professor Maki talked to PCL, PCL talked to their trades, and they were out on site and they hand sanded the concrete until it was perfectly flush and straight. Then they came in and they applied all the other materials because the principle was that if that kind of central element wasn't right, everything else would be wrong. And that was the kind of driving element that really attracted us to Maki, was that he had this incredible reputation uh, for um, designs that were really strong and humble but extremely well detailed and extremely well built. The delegation of these Miley Imamat is a building, it's, on, it's in uh, Sussex Drive. You can see it here, down here in the red. Uh, up, in the, up in the top here, anyway, up the top you can see the National Gallery and beyond that is, is um, the, the um, Parliament buildings. And they're part of this Confederation Boulevard, the historic mile in Canada. One of the defining elements there is the kind of wonderful roofscape of both uh, Central Block um, and the National um, Net National Art Galleries, and so that became an element that started to inspire the form of the delegation building. Uh, and um, here you can see it here. The building's kind of size was pretty much dictated by the guidelines that were set down on us by the City of Ottawa and the National Capital Commission. It was only allowed to be 11 meters high. We actually had to go and get a special variance to raise and create this uh, dome that you can see back there up to 17 meters to get that kind of recognized. Right beside us is the Saudi Embassy. Um, on the other side is, uh, is a highway and then the Lester B. Pearson building is just on the other side of, of, the, um, of that, of that uh, project. It's all in white. This was the space that I'd like to talk to you about. It's called the Rock Crystal Atrium and I'll tell you why. Um, this is a very special space inside the, um, the delegation building. This was the garden courtyard that was just outside that interior space. This was a view to the, to the garden from one of the lobbies. And this is a sort of a general overview of the delegation building. You can see it's really a large interior courtyard and then a large uh, space that's, that became called the Rock, the Rock Crystal Atrium. As you can see, Degacon, when he handed uh, Professor Maki the mandate for the design, suggested that the design be centered around the beautiful kind of uh, mysterious uh, mysteries of the rock crystal. Um, and th these are really just quotes from the Aga Khan's uh, letter to uh, Professor Maki, that uh, because of its translucency, its multiple planes, and the fascinations of its colors, uh, all of which present themselves dif differently as light moves around them. The hues of rock crystal are subtle, striking, and widely varied, for they, they can be clear or milky white. Um, so the inspiration then became the crystal, translucent, transparent, and opaque. I'm going to talk to, I'm going to start talking. This is when we actually started talking to our engineers and we, 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 we actually worked with an engineer named John Coymans, um, who was working with the, the engineering firm at the time, Hulk Royalis. And the discussion was how can we kind of take a rock crystal, how can we take its qualities and how can we make it kind of the defining element, the heart of the building that would be used uh, as a central program element for the building. So there became a series of studies of, the, of rock crystals. Started to define a kind of forms and shapes that we could use. And this, of course, we were working with uh, John Coyman, our, our structural engineer at the time. And John sort of kept reminding us that really this, these crystal forms are not necessarily kind of true forms, like inherently structural forms, like a column or um, a, uh, or an arch or a dome. In other words, you've got all of these forces kind of going off and then folding and coming down. And so John felt that that was not for him a true structural column, a true structural force. 
Um, we looked at starting to, we had a l very large space to span. We had 25 meters that um, by 25 meters was essentially a square space. We started building a series of models. Um, they were, and of course it had to be very transparent to allow a lot of light in. Ottawa actually has about 300 days of sunlight. I didn't realize that as we were kind of, so it's actually quite a lot of sunlight. There's, there's a lot of, it also has quite a bit of, gets quite hot in the summer. It's a great deal of heat load on, on glass atriums. But um, this required a lot, of, a lot of light. But the first thing was to get, let, a lot of, let a lot of light into the space. The next thing is how do we control that light? And how do we start to make it reflect the um, elements of a rock crystal that was going to be central to the kind of spirit and symbol of the building? So there was a series of models that were built. Um, there were other elements that were added to it. There was a screen that was added, as you can see, underneath the kind of model there that started to become an element that, that, uh, that let the light in, but also sort of allowed, sort of filtered the light as it started to move into the space. Uh, there was another lattice screen that was added around the perimeters of the interior. Uh, there were more models that were, that were built as, as the design progressed. You can see how this, the, the kind of the atrium is starting to take shape, really very much inspired by the forms of the rock crystal. Um, these are all hand-built models, by the way. They were all built by students. And um, so students are actually quite remarkable. Um, they, I, I'm, I've just finished a big deadline at the office, and I'm just in awe of the students and the young architects we have working for us. They are so talented, so dedicated, um, that they're really, um, yeah, we're just kind of in awe when we watch how they can kind of take computer programs, but also they can build with their hands and, and just with, with rulers and scales, they can build these things and they can build them to show ourselves and to show clients what the impact of, of uh, their design vision is. And these actually are far more, um, these models are far more effective, I think, than computer generated drawings. They really are. They just tell you so much because you can walk around them, you can kind of look in them and you can really gather. So this became really part of the process of working on the Agacon. Uh, on the delegation building was a lot of models were made uh, to show how this structure was going to work. And you can start to see this also. Uh, John Coymans is working out some of the structural elements um, to define how the, the, uh, the glass is going to stand up, how it's going to make it span, how it's going to be column free. You get a sense of some of the more material elements that are going to be advised. And the, the, we used to go to, we used to take these models and would go to Aglemont at the time in, um, in France and meet with the Agacon and go through them. And uh, he's very engaged in the process of, of, um, of having this. This was so central to this first building. It was also the first building in Canada uh, of this significance. And it was so central that it be right. So you can see the difference. This is a computer-generated drawing. I mean, this is a, this is a model. It's a handcrafted, hand-built model. This is a computer-generated drawing, but what we're trying to do is capture the light quality um, as it kind of filters through the screens. And you can see around the edges, we're starting to introduce kind of a, a, a lattice screen around the perimeter as well. These are sort of a summary of some of the, the imagery that had been developed and that was used in the presentations, uh, not only to uh, John, but also to um, uh, His Highness. And these actually became the components. This drawing shows the components of what ultimately became the rock crystal interpretation. Uh, one, there was a structural steel, which you can see in the center. Um, and on top of that, there was skylight glazing was laid on top. Underneath that, there was an inner shell with a glass fiber fabric that filtered light out. Um, underneath that, there was a screen support. And beneath that, there was a lattice screen. And all of these kind of elements became what was known as the rock crystal. Uh, all of them were designed to kind of float free inside the space without really being connected to the space. The intention was that when you were in the space, you had to have a feeling of lightness, that um, you had to have a feeling of the sun being filtered through it at different times. And you could see perhaps as the sun changed as it moved throughout the course of a day. Uh, there were sort of other issues that that were kind of had to be addressed at the same time. We had to put fire sprinklers in there. We had to put 
uh, mechanical, electrical, and lighting, and all of them had to be, in essence, invisible so that they couldn't be seen and they couldn't, be, they couldn't obstruct. What the intention was, was to really make this feeling of this wonderful space um, become a space, and maybe it's a bit like the music, that it, it just feels, actually music, it would be really great in a space like that, but, um, but it's a feeling that's about in our hearts as much as anything else. <coughs> uh, here's uh, uh, Gary Kamamoto, uh, he's the Aga Khan, um, and Professor Maki, Behind it, the Aga Khan is Azul Samji, who was, uh, he was a representative here, an amazing guy. Next to him was uh, Shemez Mohammed, also incredible, uh, who they became, they were really our day-to-day our -day contacts. Uh, very distinguished in and of themselves. Like, they, I mean, it's amazing. They had such distinguished careers, but they, they actually stepped aside from their careers so they could manage and act as project managers for these projects. And um, they were, uh, yeah, they were very inspirational to work with. So just to, to look at sort of the steel assembly, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd show you some images from the, the project as it was underway. Um, here you can see the steel starting to go in shape. Um, one of the things that Professor Maki wanted to have, and I think we worked with John on that, was he wanted to have really crisp, clean steel. He did, and so what, the, what you're looking at here is steel that is from Germany, from uh, um, Gartner uh, in Germany has uh, uh, made the steel and sent it over. All the steel is actually bolted in place. It's not welded in place. Professor Maki did not want any welding. Um, he just wanted to have these really crisp edges. If you look at most steel columns these days, they're sort of, a lot of them are hollow, and a lot of them are kind of, um, it's more the manufacturing process. There's also an economy of scale with the way they're built. But this is solid steel, and um, you can see this kind of solid steel lattice, which is being built up over the space. And you, you can see these kind of turnbuckles that are kind of holding, um, maybe I'll get another image of it. This is sort of the perimeter kind of element beam that ran around the perimeter of the, of the atrium space. And here you can see the bolted, and the bolted sections then had caps put on them so that when you looked at them, they were solid, just solid white. So what you're trying to do is to let as much sunlight in without trying so that the sunlight has its major, as much natural light into the space. Um, with a, it's a column-free space, so therefore the, the structure itself is very important in allowing uh, as much glazing as possible without obscuring the glazing. Okay. You can see some more images. There's the bolts that stiffen it. There was the glass assembly. Glass was in three different levels. You can see how the glass is all in place. And then there was the glass fiber screen that followed after that. This was the kind of bolt connection. Everything, everything was hung from the glass ceiling. Screens are starting to be installed. The lattices are being installed. You can see as they slowly take over the space. All the fire sprinklers ran up and kind of popped out from those kind of uh, nexus joints at the center so that they, could, they were hidden and not, not seen. There's a lot of screen support that was again connected to it and suspended from it. And then the lot of screens were installed. And then we had our space. It's actually, um, it's a wonderful space to be in. It's very quiet. It's a very quiet space to be in. It's a great space to have different activities and events. Again, I'm getting to five minutes. I'll be finished in five. But um, you can see it at different times of day and at nighttime.
And that's one space. That's one space, one building. Um, and I think it, what I wanted to say about it with regards to the technology is that the technology was really, was what worked so well um, in terms of, of providing a minimal amount of structure. Great, obviously great engineers make that possible. Glass technology has really advanced. Um, the way our mechanical systems have really advanced to allow that. So technology, when we talk about sort of good, bad, or indifferent, I would say the technology here was quite remarkable and it's, it's uh, stimulating to see it being used to, uh, I think, advance um, a sense of spirit and a sense of place that is really an important aspect of what the work of the, of the delegation building is, is undertaking. And that's, that's my presentation to you today, so that's it. I don't know if there's any questions, but no, no questions. No, Sorry. There, there will be a question okay. section after. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. All right. Appreciate we don't need to have a break, right? We don't need to have a break now. There's coffee out there. How many of you would you like to have a quick break now? Because we have two more speakers. It has been a little bit rearranged because of the time changes. So could you please put up your hand who would like to have a break, a quick break now? Okay, so why don't we have just a very quick five, ten minute break and then we continue.